Hello, 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 I'm Scott uh, from Basingstoke in Hampshire. I will talk slowly, as Albert has suggested. Um, thank you for this incredible opportunity. I'm so honoured to be here. I'm properly inspired by some of the things I've seen. I can't wait to collaborate with many of you. Um, my role, I'm a teacher. I teach at Basingstoke College of Technology um, two days a week, but three days a week. I now teach teachers how to use technology and digital tools, apps, social media, websites, and so on. So my role now is to help teachers, just as much as it is to actually teach my creative media students. Hmm? Oh. So, almost 10 years now, I've been a teacher. In the last two years, my role has sort of evolved and twisted and changed into something different. Um, I've been, had nice things said about the way I was teaching in media, but I was asked to help everybody do that, all subjects across my institution to do that. So subjects as diverse as construction, art and design, engineering, games development. My role was to help to teach teachers in all these diverse areas across our vocational college, where we have mainly 16 to 20 year old learners, many of whom have learning needs, and to help teachers to design meaningful, impactful digital pedagogy. So, a year ago, I was given one day off from teaching to help train a team of students, called them my digital leaders. So I'm pretty techy and geeky and nerdy and I love this, I think it's fun, I think it's really interesting. Many of my students love it as well. Many of your students love apps, social media, technology, so I just used that energy, used that wonderful resource that we had available. So I took these digital leaders, trained them every single Wednesday, and we taught every single teacher on inset days in their staff rooms via social media, constantly going into their staff rooms, into their classrooms, to teach them different tricks and tips on demand, whenever the teachers needed it, because teachers haven't got time. That's what we always say. So digital leaders were available on demand, bespoke, tailored, one-to-one -one training for all teachers across all courses whenever they wanted it. So my BCOT digital leaders really helped me to get into classrooms and to train people. This worked quite nicely, because if it's just me, their peer, then they're a bit reticent and reluctant to engage with me because it's like admitting you need help if you're a teacher and you're a bit behind on this. It hurts their egos. I'm sure some of, you, some of you are nodding, that's interesting. It's the ego, isn't it? That's what it is. It, teachers don't want to admit they need help a lot of the time, as well as not having en enough time. But the students, the digital leaders, getting out and training people and showing them, look, this is fun, this is how we learn, that's what ticked it over, that's what made it work. We trained every single member of staff on insert days. Ofsted, our regulators in England, come and saw and very much praised what we were doing as well. We've got a team now, this academic year. The college has backed us enormously. So I manage a team now. I've got a team of learning facilitators who manage these learning zones. We heard about learning spaces earlier on. We've got two learning zones. We've converted our library and a separate classroom on the other side of our campus. Two learning zones where every single student goes for one hour of timetabled, blended digital learning every week. Now it's my team's job to actually create the content and to create meaningful, engaging lessons that relate to their criteria, relate to their careers. So, here's some of the examples that we've been doing. We use Facebook quite a bit. So, Facebook's really good for debate groups. Uh, for example, we've been debating about Donald Trump the last couple of weeks. That's been quite interesting. We've been debating about feminism this week up to 180 students from different courses like public services, games development, arts, philosophy, have been going at each other and debating in a Facebook group, a closed group. Their teachers are in it as well. This encourages their professional digital reputation. It's a space for teachers to remind students of deadlines and to share their work, to share good examples, articles, links and videos as well. 
closed Facebook groups to encourage that digital reputation, which is going to help or haunt them throughout their lives. And it's not our responsibility, I believe, to teach them how to use it well. Groups are great for cons consolidating lessons as well, giving people tips and advice and pointers and just extension tasks from what you've actually done in the lesson. I've not mentioned the Facebook debate group once in any of my lessons. 180 students joined it on their own and are debating outside of the lessons, above and beyond the actual lecture. So any juicy, particularly controversial topic, drop it in the debate group and your students will go at it. They will show you that critical thinking, that communication skill set that we look to encourage in our learners. Some of the comments can get in excess of 150 comments, just students arguing, debating, sharing, learning, collaborating. It's electric. It's brilliant. We use Facebook as well to connect with industry. So, to have that real authentic project that we were referring to earlier on, we have, we, on Facebook and social media, we reach out to industry and say, look, do you want to sponsor our courses? Do you want to be a guest speaker? Or do you want to maybe come in and train our students? If the students know the industry are watching what they do on Facebook, it makes them work even harder. It raises the stakes, raises the standards to industry standard. Students can create their own charity campaigns, their own Kickstarter campaigns, Indiegogo they've used as well, to promote their projects and raise funds. We, as teachers across the college, role model to them how to use social media as well. We have accounts and we use it professionally to reach out to industry, to promote our students and to show them how it's done. Instagram. Now, Instagram is really popular amongst particularly 13, 14, 15 year olds and it's wonderful as a tool. You can make little video clips of your students and they can make video clips of themselves as well, up to one minute long of them showing they know something. How to change a, a, some brakes on a car maybe or perhaps how to actually work out an equation or maybe just them recording a vlog explaining their process on a project, reflecting maybe. But that evidence is incredible. And what's really nice is that students can comment underneath on each other's photographs or videos as well. This is really, really powerful. In terms of peer reflection and collaboration, that's been a real winner, particularly in art and design. They've been, use been using that really well. Periscope is really nice as well. I've been using Periscope quite a lot for the last year and almost two years now. So on Periscope, you can broadcast live video from your device, um, which can be viewed live or replayed later on. This is great for promoting a diverse set of views beyond just the echo chamber of their classroom. So, we use Twitter quite a lot. My students tweet on certain debates, and I tweeted out a while ago to anybody around the world to debate with my students on certain topics. Got tired of just the same people putting their hands up to answer. People who didn't want to actually verbalize their thoughts, and that was me when I was, it's weird I'm here in front of 500 people talking in front of you, but when I was 15, 16, I didn't want to talk in class, it was embarrassing. But, using Twitter, if I ask a question, they can all simultaneously respond on a set hashtag. ATO debate, across the ocean debate. We were debating with American students using this tag. Some people chose to tweet. Some people chose to go on Periscope and to articulate and verbalize their responses. Art design students, games development and media students. We found that the more competent and vocal students actually chose to actually go on camera and join in. But those who didn't want to could just tweet along and join in, in the discussion that way. But this grew and grew. Birmingham, Alabama in the United States, a big college there, the Enterprise School, joined in and our students were recording videos and the next day, like a message in a bottle because of the time delay of course, their students would respond and send us back a video as well of their thoughts on a particular topic. This made the students make extra care and extra attention with their syntax, their grammar, their articulation of their points. The fact that not only their, would their fellow students be seeing it, but people on the other side of the world. 
Our students use Google. We're a Google college very much so. It's the best digital pencil case that I can see, to be honest. Uh, the collaborative tools are fantastic. In our lessons, students collaborate using Google Docs. They can simultaneously type into a document, make lecture notes to be shared with their peers. Really recommend using Google Docs. We use Google Slides as well. So Google Slides is like PowerPoint, but it's just collaborative. And a few more neat features as well. So my students can make comic strips with each other. So they can actually take photographs of each other, upload it, and add in captions, arrows, to illustrate a comic strip. This can be used particularly well in he health and social care. They used it well to illustrate health and safety in the workplace, making a humorous comic strip, illustrating their learning collaborating in real time, really nice, and again, free. In terms of communication skills, something else we're very focused on developing in our students. We do live streaming. Now, for guest speakers in particular, it's a bit of an imposition to ask them to book a day off and to come in and to do an hour's talk. But live streaming, Facebook Live, Periscope, YouTube Live, they can be beamed into your classroom, nice and simply, using the Skype or Google Hangouts, perhaps. I've been using live streaming a lot, particularly when students are doing an activity, a practical task, I tend to live stream it as well. They know that the outside world is looking, then they tend to, again, focus a bit more. The fact it's not just an activity in the classroom. This is being seen beyond the four walls of the college. It's real. We do screencasts quite a lot, and we encourage our students to do screencasts. So. I record myself literally talking through an assignment. This is really useful for students who've missed the lesson where I've gone over the assignment, or if you just weren't paying attention in class that time. Maybe you were tired, maybe you had something else on your mind. Students can replay the videos of me going through the assignment brief, clarifying things before they actually submit the assignment. They've got a clear road as to how to get there. Students also create their own screencast of them actually going through their work as well and submit that as a assignments as well. Really useful way to differentiate the way they respond. Rather than just it being another Word document they've submitted, they can record screencasts of them literally showing how to use software or literally showing their process. Twitter we use pretty much every day, to be honest with you. We normally start with, any, te who, any teachers there by show of hands? Teachers, teachers by show of hands? Hello teachers, hello, hello. Um, this is great as a starter or a plenary to start your subjects with an open-ended question as they come in that sets the theme and the debate. It's wonderful, so powerful. And then straight away before the lesson's even started, they've all answered a directed question. And then you can curate and draw out the actual responses into Socratic and cascaded questions. Again, developing that digital literacy, that communication skill set. Podcasts. My, my students love making podcasts. So I don't, I don't mark my work anymore with written text anymore. Students don't read it. I do do podcasts. Turn it on my phone, press the voice recorder. You've all got one in your pocket right now. Just press voice recorder. Literally, all right, Dave did really well on that assignment. The spelling's a little bit unclear here. Maybe you need to reconsider paragraph three. I really like what you've written in paragraph five. Oh, this is brilliant, and so on and so on. Boop. Save it, ping it to Dave, feedback. Nice and easy, nice and quick. Podcasts, I'm getting through my feedback and my marking really quickly doing podcasts. Can't recommend it enough. And my students are recording podcasts as evidence of their understanding as well, articulating it verbally rather than just another document. Google Hangouts, now, it's sort of like WhatsApp, I suppose. Um, my team, the digital team, we use it every day to stay in touch with each other. A really nice way for instant messaging. Particularly for our teachers, it's really crucial for them to be able to contact the digital team for help on demand. They contact us via Hangouts. Grammarly's great as well. Grammarly's really interesting. I've been, we use Chromebooks, like a couple of the schools we've met today, and we can roll out the Grammarly extension. Grammarly checks the syntax, the grammar, the spelling, and recommends syn synonyms and other alternatives for phrasing, an email, a tweet, a document. Really nice way, nice free tool, Grammarly. Google Forms. For quizzes, 
and surveys, we can't find anything better than this. Many of our subjects are using this every day. Really nice as an exit ticket as well at the end of the session to get your students to fill in a quick Google form and it generates the charts and graphs for you at the end instantly. Lovely. For note taking, my students tend to use Google Keep. Across the college, every student has a Google account, of course, as we're a Google college. They use Google Keep. They put their notes in and it automatically syncs in the cloud and they can access their notes everywhere. No one loses their notes. No one loses anything, in fact, ever. That excuse is gone because we've got the cloud. Everything goes in their unlimited Google Drive because if you're a G Suite college, a Google college, you get unlimited storage. Really good. Google Keep is fantastic for creating notes, audio, video, or just text notes. You can color coordinate them as well. Again, free. Google Sites got a mention earlier on, and rightly so, it's fantastic. So, we use WordPress and Tumblr and other spaces for students to document their work, but Google Sites could be one of the best right now. Really simple, intuitive, drag and drop design of how to build a website. Students can evidence their understanding in any number of subjects by creating a Google Site and sharing it. We've had students in engineering using this. We've had students in hair and beauty photograph their progress and the makeup design's been working on as photographs and videos, posting it on their Google sites and then annotating it. Really, really effective. And in terms of the teachers marking that work, what better evidence is there of someone showing hair and beauty and makeup development than that video and photographic evidence? Rather than an assignment, this is a far more effective way to assess. Guys in business two weeks ago were using this. This is Picture Chart. So Picture Chart is really wonderful for creating infographics and charts to show research or demonstrate a particular fact. Again, intuitive, simple graphic design, drag and drop, really simple to pick up on. Canva is also very effective. Canva has been very popular in particular with our art students. We've also found that ESOL, our English speakers of other language students, have really taken to this as well as a way to communicate in a visual way. So in terms of making advertising work or any design work, one of the best tools that we've found. Kahoot was mentioned earlier on. Uh, Kahoot is fantastic. Quizzes is also fantastic. Again, great as a starter or a plenary to actually check the understanding of your learners perhaps as a formative check maybe. Quizzes, again, completely free, as are all these tools that I'm showing you, by the way. A great way for students to test each other as well if they make their own quizzes and share it with one another. So Edpuzzle. So videos are great. Students learn but through videos, as has been mentioned already today, but they can be passive sometimes. Edpuzzle, put any video in there and you can decide when the video stops, asks a question, forces the learner to engage and to show they are listening, show they are understanding, and only once they show this does the video continue to play. Nice. Ed Puzzle, really intuitive, really simple. Students can make them for each other to test their understanding on a particular topic. The business students have been doing that recently. Our construction students and games development students were using this about, about a month ago, or two months ago actually, Virtual Lego, a free Chrome extension. They were using Lego to actually set out the foundations of a building they were planning to create. So in terms of developing creativity and structural knowledge, it was a nice way to introduce the topic in a fun manner. Particularly our mathematics lecturers were using it as well to show and demonstrate volume as well. LinkedIn. Every single student is encouraged to create a LinkedIn profile. From the moment they join, they make a Twitter account, a LinkedIn profile as well, because their digital reputation is paramount. Every single learner at the college is actively encouraged to create a digital reputation that makes them employable, that makes them undeniable when they go for that interview, whether it be university, another college, an apprenticeship, a job, Employers will look online. They look online. So it's essential that 
Our students look fantastic online. So every project they do is put on their LinkedIn profile. If they collaborate with each other well, then they recommend each other. They endorse each other's skills. So after a project, my students go up to each other and say, could you endorse me for communication skills? Or could you say that I've got creativity problem-solving skills? This makes them somewhat more mature when the actual group work begins, because they know there's consequences. They're going to actually be assessing each other, peer assessing each other. The best work, I write a written recommendation for them. So essentially on their online CV, which is what LinkedIn is, of course, they get a recommendation from me saying that they clearly show competence or great skill in a particular area. In terms of their networking as well, in terms of them promoting their work and getting their work seen to potential employers, incredibly valuable. We use Snapchat as well. In automotive, our budding mechanics were using Snapchat to evidence their process and their progress throughout an actual lesson. So they were using a collection of images and videos and annotating them on their mobile devices. These Snapchat stories, as they're called, were given to their lecturers for assessment, little two, three minute videos at the end of the lesson to show they knew each of the bits they needed to do, the progress throughout changing a car engine. It can also be used by teachers in arts and in automotive. Some of the teachers have actually been using it as a way to remind students of when an assessment is due in or to remind them of when a workshop's available. Now, I've gone quite quick then, haven't I, Albert? That's good though, isn't it? You're back on track, hopefully, now. Yay, good. Nice one. Oh, thank you. Thank you.